Since the dawn of the 21st century, scientific discovery has rushed forward at lightning speed. Genetics, physics, computerized technology, robotics, virtual reality. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert as they uncover the truths behind this ultimate scientific deception. Welcome to Sci Friday. Archaeology is one of our favorite kinds of... Science! Welcome to Sci Friday. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we once again want to welcome you into our homes. If you are sitting and enjoying some tea or coffee or cocoa with your family, we are just so very glad that many of you say your kids and grandkids like to watch this show. <laughs> uh, that, that warms our hearts. You it would really not does. believe. Yes. Both of us were, well, we were nerds in school. I was the kid who would stay late. In fact, I missed the bus one time because I was in the library. I was in like the third grade, third or fourth grade. And I was in the library. We had just consolidated to a bigger school with a big library. I discovered the dinosaur books. Oh. I missed my bus. I, I can see why. The principal took me home. Yeah, I can see why. Dinosaurs are... I, I had a dinosaur-themed dinosaur birthday party when I was uh, 10 or 11. You I lucky forget. guy. Yeah, I know. It was pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. To this day, I still dream about dinosaurs occasionally. Yeah, um, they're not good ones either. Not usually, but uh, at least Giant as I've gotten older, I usually get away. But Doxysaurs, <laughs> dachshunds, they're like, you know, T-Rexes. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to do a program sometime on how we fit dinosaurs into a creationist model of history. That. Yeah, yes, we that will would definitely do that program. because, uh, in fact, we could do a series of uh, interviews on that, I'm sure, we and could. make some good programs, because that is obviously one of the uh, one of the uh, big questions of uh, the, the the creation model. Why would God create all of these dinosaurs and then uh, wipe them out again? Well, exactly, and and that's the kind of show yeah. that we need to actually right. address the question at length with sort of bullet points that we talk about right. instead of just off the cuff, because it's a big. It important really important topic. Absolutely. But but we do have a, uh, a series. We're beginning three programs now featuring interviews with a gentleman that we met last fall at the International Symposium on Archaeology and the Bible. And we're very excited about this because we're going back this year to the International Symposium on Archaeology and the Bible. We are. They're letting us come back. We were... We were <laughs> We were good. We there didn't were a cause lot any of trouble. things they told us that we they said you may not tell anyone and we haven't. Mm. We haven't told Tom Horn. That's true. That's We've true. We've told no one. I I talked to you about it, but that's about it. But that's okay. It didn't come out, out, go outside these walls. Yeah. But uh, yes, we'll be discussing with Dr. Philip Sylvia evidence for the discovery of Sodom. And it's not in the traditional places where we've been told. No, it has not. So stay with us after our break, which we'll be taking in about five minutes, mm -hmm. a little less than that, because we want you to watch part one of this. It's three parts. Yes. And uh, the third part is really fascinating because it's only tangentially related to Sodom. It's another discovery that was made at the site that relates to uh, the, the earth reeling like a drunkard. I know. <laughs> in the a, past. In the past, Not right. Not just in the future. It was in the past as well. Well, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. That's what Solomon said. That is correct. And many of these things now are coming to light here in the last days. One of those things is a discovery in northern Iraq as the Tigris River is, the levels of the Tigris are I have falling. allergies. <laughs> oh, yeah. It is definitely pollen season here in the Ozarks. Um, the Mosul Reservoir has been dropping. And uh, this is due to uh, just changing cycles of rainfall across the earth. And as the water levels have dropped in this reservoir, an ancient city believed to be one of the major cities of the Mitanni kingdom has been exposed. This is believed to be the city of, um, uh, the site is called Kimun, but the, uh, the city is, uh, and I've got to look this up again because the name is uh, difficult to pronounce. City well, with no name. Uh, there we go, Zaikiku, Zaikiku. Um, the, the Mitanni are one of is the- Is it near Turkey, eh? <laughs> uh, yes, it's near the border with Turkey. Eh? Uh, it's not a well-known ancient kingdom. The Mitanni were one of the three global powerhouses in the days of um, uh, Jacob, Joseph, and the uh, the Israelites. So 1400 During, or so, 1450? Yes, between about 1550 and 1350 BC, the Mitanni kingdom 
the uh, Hittite kingdom and the Egyptian kingdom were the three main global superpowers. The Babylonians were sort of like an also ran at that point in history. So it's kind of exciting that this uh, site has emerged from the Tigris River because the Hurrians, not well known, they're in the Bible as the Horites, but they're much more important in the Bible than we've been led to believe. So this is a, uh, an exciting discovery and archaeologists are working like mad to uh, excavate what they can before the water levels rise again. That's amazing. I just realized that I'm putting earrings on. Oh, well. By the way, I want to, because maybe that's best I didn't because it really makes this stand out. I want to thank Bill Old Chief for sending me this. Isn't this beautiful? That is absolutely it's gorgeous. It's hand beaded. Yeah. Bill is a, a leader among the Blackfeet Nation in northern Montana, and we've gotten to know him through the internet. He's got a ministry there in northern Montana, uh, a fireball preacher and, and a wonderful musician, and uh, he found Cy Friday, and uh, God bless you, Bill. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I didn't bring the pin. He, he actually sent me a tribal pin. Oh, he did? I I'll know. bring that out on the next program. Yes. I'll bring that on the next program. By the way, that you did an interview with Bill Old Chief mm -hmm. recently on View from the Bunker. That's right. Which is available on our Gilbert House app. Right. So if you've got the Gilbert House app or if you've got our channel for Roku or Apple TV, you can go to the View from the Bunker section there and uh, look up the interview with Bill Old Chief. And uh, he tells the story of uh, how there's a real move of the Lord taking place among the, uh, the Blackfeet people, which is really just an incredible story. The Lord but, is moving amongst a lot of peoples, and I think that yes. because, you know, we tend to think about our own little tribe locally, mm -hmm. but the Lord has lots and lots of ethnos, ethnicity. He does. He does. The world. And, and a lot of things that are being revealed all over the world uh, through the use and application of science. We'll talk to Dr. Philip Sylvia about uh, the discovery of Sodom next on Sci Friday. Space is not the final frontier, but there are those who want you to think it is. 75 years ago, something crashed in the desert near Roswell, New Mexico. An industry has grown up to sell the idea that the pilots were extraterrestrials. We want you to know the truth. For a limited time, we're making available a special offer featuring the groundbreaking book, The Day the Earth Stands Still. This book shows step-by-step step how the occult teachings of Madame Blavatsky and Aleister Crowley grew into the ancient aliens hypothesis of the modern UFO movement. It's our Gilbert House Roswell Special. For just $35, we'll send you The Day the Earth Stands Still, plus our DVD sets, The Best of Sci Friday, Volumes 1 and 2. It's a $65 value for just $35. Take advantage of the Gilbert House Roswell Special for a limited time only, and you'll only find it at our store, online at gilberthouse.org. Welcome back to Sci Friday. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert, and we had a really quick break because we are going to Dr. Philip Sylvia because this interview is going to knock your socks off. So just take them off now. Absolutely. It's a site in Jordan directly across from Jericho, the northeast corner of the Dead Sea. And uh, the director of scientific uh, analysis for the site, Dr. Philip Sylvia. Joining us in the library this week is a gentleman who's the uh, Director of Scientific Analysis and Field Supervisor at an archaeological dig site just across the Jordan River from Jericho. It's called Tal El Hammam, but that was not its name in ancient times. He's the uh, co-author of a paper recently published in a peer-reviewed journal published by Nature called Scientific Reports. The title of this paper, A Tunguska-Sized Airburst Destroyed Tall El Hammam, a Middle, Age, Bron a Middle Bronze Age City in the Jordan Valley near the Dead Sea. Here to explain why this is more exciting than that title would indicate is uh, Dr. Philip Sylvia. Phil, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure to be with you. Tall El Hammam... Uh, why is uh, this an exciting archaeological site, and what is it that you and your team have found there? Well, it's an exciting archaeological site because, uh, first of all, the, the time frame that we're interested in is the Middle Bronze Age period, uh, which is the time of Abraham uh, in the biblical narrative. And this site, Tal el Hammam, is the largest single urban center in the Southern Levant during that period of time. So it, it's, a, it's a very large city, and it represents a, a major political force in the region. So we will consider it to be the anchor city of a city-state complex. So just, just its sheer size alone 
demands attention. And, and that's what's exciting to us. So this, um, this is a city that might have been important enough for an army to march all the way across Mesopotamia to do battle against its king? Um, yes, certainly. Uh, it, it controlled the major east-west, north-south trade route on the east side of the Jordan River, you know, north of the Dead Sea. So it, it was a very influential city at the time. Um, and whether or not that, you know, presented either a, a political threat or, or an inducement because of its wealth uh, for invasion is it possible. But what's curious is there is no, at least we have not found any physical evidence of military conquest there. What we have is a large urban center that was continuously occupied from at least the beginning of the Chalcolithic period, which would put it initially occupied around 4600, 4500 BC, continuously occupied without invasion, without any evidence of military conquest, until it was somehow destroyed rather violently, rather quickly, and uh, in about 1700 BC, around the time of Abraham. Now, Cities have been destroyed in warfare over the centuries, but just to reiterate, you have not found any evidence of a military conquest there. Correct. The damage that we see over the course of time at our site is damage that was induced by earthquake activity. You know, the, the Dead Sea obviously sits in the deepest crack in the Earth's surface. It's a tectonically active region. It is prone to earthquakes and, and major earthquakes periodically. And we see evidence of earthquake damage in, in the structures, in the architecture. Um, but yet uh, the city kept on ticking. There, there is none of the classical, uh, what we call a BDA sequence, a period of building followed by a period of destruction, usually by military conquest, followed by a period of abandonment. So we have that building a destruction, abandonment, that BDA sequence that typically can be seen in a normal uh, tell, or at least on the Arabic side, we call them talls instead of tells. Uh, we do not have that sequence. We have just uh, evidence of continuous occupation uh, over a very long period of time, you know, multiple thousand years. Um, we don't have that destruction and abandonment sequencing. We just have a moving window of time uh, in, in our, at, at our site, which makes it very unique. Now, the destruction layer at uh, Tall El Hammam, how is the destruction there different from what you'd expect from a, a major earthquake event? Well, first of all, in a major earthquake event, usually what you have the ground move, moves in a linear motion like we are on a north-south strike slip fault. And so you have the, the slips move, the, the two different plates are moving like this against each other. And every time they, they lock, and then when they shift quickly, that's what creates an earthquake. And that sends ripples through the ground that basically work in a linear fashion so that they, they typically move north and south because that's where, that's how the plates are moving under the Great Rift Valley. So when you see an earthquake destruction, you have, you have debris that falls like on both sides of a, of a foundation wall. But in our case, in that destruction layer from about 1700 BC, what we see is everything fell or was blown in a single direction, blown from the southwest towards the northeast. That is very uncharacteristic of earthquake activity, and it is very unique to our situation. So something exploded, and the force of the explosion pushed everything in one direction. Well, that was one of the initial clues that caused us to investigate uh, more seriously uh, and in, in greater depth. What was the destruction mechanism? That's the question that we've been trying to answer. What was the destruction mechanism? And you're right. It does appear that there was a very violent explosion of some sort to the southwest of our site. 
and so that the force traveled from the southwest to the northeast. All of the destruction debris was pushed in a northeasterly direction, and that was one of the initial clues that uh, uh, led us to believe that, okay, something happened here that would have blown all of this material in a single direction, and that is the quest that, that well, personally, I have been on since my involvement in 2010, uh, and then my first time to the site in 2012 was to try and understand what was that mechanism that what? caused this particular and very unique destruction pattern. What, what kind of force are we talking about here? Is this something that, uh, I mean, I know that gunpowder is not supposed to have been invented uh, until much later and in China, but is this something that um, could have happened through uh, somebody accidentally setting off uh, a, a petroleum product or something? <laughs> Well, of course, that has been one of the great theories uh, uh, that has been around for many, many years, that, that uh, well, perhaps the, the ground uh, burped a, a large cloud of methane gas, and somehow that got ignited maybe by lightning uh, and caused a massive explosion. Uh, well, no, that just doesn't work. When you ha if you have it in a confined space, then you can build up enough pressures to knock things over. But when you're in, you know, in an open area, uh, you'll you'll get a fireball, but you won't get as much of a concussive force um, from you know just an effusion of methane gas coming out of a fissure in the ground. Um, just doesn't work that way. Well, let me let, let me just tell you how what the effect was when that blast went off. Picture now the buildings are field stone foundations with mud brick superstructures on top of it. So the walls are made out of unreinforced air-dried mud brick. Houses, the, the walls may be typically up to about a half a meter thick or, or less. The monumental structures, you know, the palace, the temple, 2.6 meters and sometimes greater in thickness. So you're talking multi-story uh, mud brick buildings. Um, all of the residential structures that were particularly on the lower portion of Tal al Hammam were completely blown off of their foundations and destroyed. The very thick and large, tall rampart walls, the defensive walls that 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 provided the protection for the city around the lower tell, but especially on the upper tell. Um, these are you know, many meters thick at the base, and what we see based on what is left for us to actually excavate on the upper portion of the tell, which we call the Acropolis, it's where the king's palace was located, uh, everything that projected above these massive rampart walls just got sheared off. And we're talking about very, very thick walls. So you had enough explosive force to level these very heavy mud brick buildings on the lower tell, which were mostly residential, and then to shear off whatever was exposed above the very thick uh, protective defensive walls uh, on the upper. And we're talking multiple stories being sheared off because we're looking at buildings that were three and four stories uh, high. And that's why the, the mud brick walls were so thick on the lower stories because they had to support all of that weight above them. So massive amounts of concussive energy, of blast force, was unleashed not only on this site but across the entire valley floor north of the Dead Sea. Just, just so viewers have a, a sense of context here, uh, you, you mentioned 2.6 meters. That's roughly eight to nine feet if my math in my head is, is correct. So you're talking something, even though mud brick's not the most durable or uh, S uh, strongest building material out there still when you've got a wall that's uh, in the v eight to nine feet thick that's 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 substantial and these were just in in a moment's time just knocked uh, basically clean off just like somebody had taken a some sort of cosmic bulldozer and just sheared them off above the layer of the defensive the defensive walls of the city Certainly the residential structures, which were more on the order of a half a meter thick. Okay. Uh, in terms of their, their mud brick walls. Which is yes, still like a foot and a half thick. Off the foundation, yes. So uh, roughly, a, you, 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 when you consider the architecture, 
About a half a meter thickness for a wall is a single story building. If you go to a one meter thick wall, now you're talking about at least a two story building. So it, uh, rule of thumb is about a half a meter per story. So if you've got a, a multiple story building, and in our case, we're 2.6 meters thick in some cases, you're talking about a four story or possibly five story building. And the upper stories, yes, were sheared off on those larger buildings. The portions of them that, that projected above the large defensive rampart wall going around the, uh, the upper tell, the, uh, you know, that encompassed the upper city, as we call it, got sheared off. But now you're only talking about you know, the, the top one, two, or maybe three stories, but not, not the lower stories where it's really thick. So where the walls were really thick, we do find some mud brick remnants of the wall sitting on top of the stone foundations. But on the lower tell, which was almost entirely uh, residential, you know, private private homes, um, what we find is the stone foundations in the ground. There is no superstructure to excavate. Hmm. We'll, we'll continue this conversation next week and get into some of the particulars of the evidence that have led to your conclusions. But uh, to just wrap up this segment, uh, to put a point on it for, for viewers, Phil, you mentioned a city that was the largest in the southern Levant, an anchor city for the civilization there, in control of the trade routes east, west, and north, south, which uh, presumably would give it control over trade from Egypt to Mesopotamia and back. In the time of Abraham, destroyed by a sudden violent event, what conclusion do we draw about the identification of this city? Well, when you look at the geographical clues that are available to us in Scripture, particularly Genesis chapter 13, we are convinced that Tal al-Hammam is the most likely candidate for biblical Sodom. And what we see in the immediate region around Tal al-Hammam is there are a number of what we refer to as satellite cities. Um, they're pretty much equidistant spaced uh, within view of Tal al um, And we have identified out of all of these multiple, uh, much smaller tells, the other three that we believe are likely candidates for Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim. So when you look at Genesis chapter 10, which first mentions Sodom and the other cities of the plain by name, uh, that's an early Bronze Age, so that would take you back to about 3500 BC. Those are early Bronze Age cities. They're they're established cities to the point where they're named as as border cities of the region of Canaan, uh, and that's in Genesis chapter 10. When you get to Genesis chapter 13, you have that whole narrative between Lot and Abraham. Uh, they came down from Mesopotamia. Uh, they encountered famine in the land, so they stopped at Bethel and I, built an altar to the Lord, and then uh, because of famine in the land, they kept heading south, and they went down into Egypt for some unspecified period of time. In chapter 13, they return from Egypt back to Bethel and I, and at this point, when they come back from Egypt, they are very wealthy now in terms of the cattle and the livestock that they had with them. And you can see in that narrative that that tension builds between the shepherds of Abraham and the shepherds of Lot. And so we have that famous dialogue between the two where Abraham says to Lot, if you go left, in other words, if you go north, I'll go south. If you go south, I'll go north. And and we're told that from Bethel and I, Lot looked up and, you know, Hebrew doesn't have words for the cardinal directions, north, east, south, west. So they always, they always give you directions based on an assumption that you're facing east. So if you go left, you're going north. If you go right, you're going south. And it says, Lot looked up. In other words, he looked east, as it's translated in, in most of our English translations. He looked to the east, and from Bethel and I, we have a wonderful description of what the region looks like around Sodom. And that whole narrative concludes with Lot traveling east and settling around Sodom. Kafal Hamam is directly visible from Bethel and I. It is directly east from Bethel 
and I. So in terms of the geographical clues, which, by the way, are far more than the number of clues available even to locate Jerusalem based on the biblical texts, uh, we have over 20 clues for the location of Sodom. We have about a dozen clues for the location of Jerusalem. And so just on the geographical clues alone, it's the right place. It's at the right place time. We have an established early Bronze Age walled city to fit Genesis chapter 10. We have a very large established middle Bronze Age city. Better than that, a walled city. Because in Genesis 19, where did the two angels find Lot? Seated at the city gates. The only cities that had city gates are fortified cities. We have a very large fortified city in the time of Abraham. So it's the right place geographically. It's the right time in terms of the archaeological evidence. And it has a lot of the right stuff. And, and basically what I'm quoting is our dig director, Dr. Stephen Collins. For 20 years, he's been talking about Tal al Haman being the right place at the right time with the right stuff. My research has been focusing very specifically on the destruction event. And from what we have been finding based on the physical evidence that we're finding, Tal al Hamam also tells the right story. Everything that we're finding about its destruction is consistent with the biblical text of the destruction event of Sodom. But I should also add, whether or not it's Sodom is irrelevant to the scientific evidence and the scientific inquiry that we've been making about the, the destruction event and its processes. But if it is Sodom, that sure adds a lot to the story. <laughs> that, that is just mind-blowing. And the evidence that they put together methodically uh, has convinced me, and I think you as well. Well, he, in order to get these papers published and peer-reviewed, and this has, some of this has already been published in the mainstream mm -hmm. media, the mainstream media will just tear you apart. Been As a, will your fellow scientists. Well, there's been a real firestorm that's been kicked up by this uh, paper. We'll talk about that more next week as to some of the criticisms. But uh, the evidence, the scientific evidence, most of the criticisms are not directed at the science. It's directed at the fact that they're Christians and it doesn't know. fit the time frame. And, but well, you know, you, we yeah. have to let the science speak and then uh, it does fit the biblical narrative. That's for sure. It does. So we're going to have part two of this next week. In the meantime, don't forget, forget gilberthouse.org will take you to our hub mm -hmm. for everything Derek and I do. And our web, our free app is right there under get our free app. Yes. Don't look, just, you can't miss it. It's in the top menu bar there, gilberthouse.org slash app. <laughs> Until next week. Thank you for watching. This is Sci Friday. Sci Friday is a viewer supported outreach of Gilbert House Ministries. Follow us online at SciFriday.tv and GilbertHouse.org. That's where you'll find our weekly Bible study, the Gilbert House Fellowship. Join us each week as we go through the Bible verse by verse in chronological order. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us through our websites or drop us a line at P.O. Box 78, Crane, Missouri 65633.